Hello and welcome to The Periphery from the Pulaski Institution. I'm Alan Elrod and our guest today is Sean Casey. Sean is a former special representative for religion and global affairs at the United States State Department, uh, an office that he led the uh, uh, initiation of uh, under, uh, at the time, Secretary of State John Kerry. Uh, and he is also a non-resident fellow here at the Pulaski Institution. Uh, I'm really excited to have Sean here on the show. We're going to be talking primarily about his book, which is called Chasing the Devil at Foggy Bottom, uh, The Future of Religion uh, in American Diplomacy. And I think that we are going to have a really good conversation uh, about uh, religion and American foreign policy, but also we're, we're going to do a little uh, a reminiscing of the fact that we are two people from almost the same spot uh, on the earth, which is I grew up in north central Arkansas, a town called Searcy, just to the outskirts of the Ozarks, uh, and um, attended for undergrad a, a sister school of, of Sean's undergrad, at Harding, and Sean went to Abilene Christian, and Sean is from Kennett, Missouri. So, and you know, I, also I thought um, as, a, as a segue here to you talking a little bit about your upbringing, you know, my grandparents also live like an hour from Paducah. I used to go to Land Between the Lakes as a kid growing up. You know, we drove over like Barclay all the time, uh, going to places like Patty's uh, in, in for, for Thanksgiving dinner and stuff. So I was also, when you were describing that part of Kentucky, very familiar with, with the scenes there. That's great. Uh, but, but I thought I'd kick it to you and talk a little bit about, you know, because this is a book about religion and American foreign policy, I thought it might be helpful to start with your own personal experiences with your, the distinct, uh, and I think I can safely say distinct, right? Because we both know it's it's got its own quirks, uh, corner of American Christianity that you grew up in uh, and how um, that experience of it and those places uh, shaped the journey that you took into uh, being a student of of politics and foreign affairs and then eventually working at the State Department? Well, first of all, Alan, it's great great to be on with you. Thank you for the invitation, and I appreciate all the work you do at the Pulaski Institution. You know, I'm a big fan, obviously, being a a non-residential fellow. I think one of the real struggles of this book was how much of myself should I reveal and, you know, I, I got conflicting evidence. Some people said, oh, no, no, classic academic. You should never you should always be in the background. You should never be in the foreground. And yet th- there is a, a dimension of the story, which it's uniquely my story. That is the, the founder of this office and the builder of this office. I, I felt like I owed readers. Why, why am I qualified? Why, and what did I do? What was I thinking before, during and, and after uh, building this this inaugural office? that brought a a capacity to interpret religion in American diplomacy in a much more sophisticated fashion. So I I thought, well, okay, what the heck, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and put my narrative in there. And uh, I was emboldened by Catherine Zepf, who is now an editor at at Foreign Affairs. uh, And she wrote an excellent book called Excellent Daughters uh, about young uh, Saudi women today. And she drew on her own experience growing up in a small conservative Christian sect in the United States. And I found that very powerful. So I thought, well, gee, you know, I admire Catherine. She's a great writer. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to take a leap. And, and fortunately, I, I think a lot of people are they really do like that chapter. I have um, it's called Male Pale and Not Quite Yale, <laughs> and, you know, uh, sort of uh, making a, a joke of the old line about the State Department to work there. You had to be male pale and not quite Yale. Well, I'm male pale and went to that other Ivy League school up a little further north in Yale. Um, but having grown up, my, my theory is that we were about equipping embassies to interpret religion on the ground in their host country. And America had failed many, many times to understand those dynamics and, and blundered into several crises, not the least of which, in fact, the largest of which, at least in our recent memory, was, was in Iraq. So my, my thesis was having grown up in a, a peculiar sectarian, very tiny Protestant sect of the Churches of Christ in the Mid-South, in the 60s and 70s, potentially prepares one to see and to notice seemingly small, obscure things that often have large political implications. And if you have eyes that have been trained to see that, then as a diplomat, perhaps you will see things that other people might miss, particularly 
if the forms of religiosity are alien to sort of the average American experience. So I, I never assumed that small facts were irrelevant facts, but small observed items or peoples or traits or histories can often have huge implications uh, for, for the politics of a particular country. And so I, I spend a, a fair amount of time talking about what was it like to grow up in the boot heel of Missouri and in Western Kentucky in the 60s and in the 70s. And I'm, I'm not saying you have to have a master's degree in, in uh, anthropology of, of obscure American religion to be a diplomat. That wasn't my, my, my point. But it was that religion is so diverse and that even the, the so-called big religions are internally plural so that nobody knows at all about any single religion. And certainly nobody knows at all about the religiosity of seven plus seven billion plus people around the planet. But I needed to, to build an office of people who could go and watch and observe, but could also talk to scholars and, and other observers and ask good questions, because I think a lot of diplomacy is asking good questions of people and listening very carefully to their answers. So having grown up in this small, often overlooked uh, tradition in American Christianity, I think sort of prepared me to be able to ask and ask good questions and listen hard and to see uh, things that other diplomats might miss. Yeah, I think uh, for anyone unfamiliar with the Church of Christ, it's 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 interesting because in in some ways there is like in a lot of American evangelicals and there can be an anti intellectual strain, but there is also a kind of style of approach right in the Church of Christ that I think produces maybe even sometimes to the chagrin of pastors academics because it's so textual and so focused on this idea of, of building arguments from uh, the, the way an academic does, like you cite and then you cite and then you cite and you compile these little tiny facts to build your, your case, right? Uh, it, <clears throat> I mean, you talk a little bit about that, like what makes a good Church of Christ sermon in it. Yeah, I mean, that's how you, that's exactly, right? You build these little verses up to a, an argument, um, which is so academic right in a way right in, in uh, like I said I don't know if I don't know if every church of Christ preacher is is uh pleased with uh uh the decision of a of a young member to, to go that route but but it happens a lot and I think that attitude is is there um I don't know I resonated a lot when I was hearing that and, and when you were talking about this approach right to little facts I was like yeah it is something I think like whether you want to admit it or not it's like a, I think even for me coming uh, from the same background, something that, that is still a, 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 an attitudinal thing that I can't shake. Yeah, I have a friend who calls it being a cognitive Campbellite. And, and you know, the, the, the Thomas Campbell and Alexander, yeah. the yeah. Leg, legendary figures. I've known people who, who long since left the tradition behind, but whose cognitive style is still very much a rationalist sort of Scottish common sense realism approach to the world. You're looking for discrete facts that you can sort of string on beads to get a full argument. And uh, and oftentimes they're very hard to argue with because they haven't left that style behind. It's like the, their brain is still fried in the 1950s or something. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I, I tell the story about the little church of Christ where my mother was going in Kennett, Missouri. When I was born, they literally 1957 was the year of the, the booming, the boomingest year of the baby boom. That's when most babies were born. And, and so this little church was just overwhelmed with, with small kids. And so they wanted to build an addition to the building where they could have meals and dinners and things. And they discovered in the, in the blueprints that there was a kitchen in the design. And somebody said, well, wait a minute, you know, there's no, no New Testament warrant for a kitchen in a church building. And they argued back and forth. And, and finally, a, a liberal group stood up and said, well, actually, you know, in the existing building, we have a men's room and a women's room. And there's no biblical explicit warrant in the New Testament for a restroom. And so the, the liberals carried the day. And I, I used to joke with my, my recently deceased mother, my fate was sealed, but when she sided with the liberals and fell for the uh, indoor plumbing argument, <laughs> it basically it's okay to have a toilet. It was okay to have a kitchen in the building. It, explaining to anyone not um, 
not from or familiar with the Church of Christ, right? At least grew up in a town with it. The the kitchen fight is is a, such an alien thing to do. Uh, although it's a, you know, finally this is I don't want to go down this. Maybe we can come back to it later since it's such a rabbit hole. But sometimes I think that few people are better prepared for understanding the kind of weird logic of constitutional originalism than church of christ people because a lot of people are going to go well how on earth could we make every decision based on what the founders wrote literally and exactly intended and go well uh half the fights in my church were were about whether or not uh you could do things like have a potluck uh on (laughs) what what people don't understand today that the the attorneys who do still pretend to be originalists and and they're pretending um, don't realize that that's a hermeneutic inherited from conservative Protestantism of several <laughs> centuries ago. And these are Roman Catholic Supreme Court justices are holding on to originalism. Yeah. Uh, and they don't understand the intellectual history that they're, they're miming there. Uh, but they've got a J degree, degree from a you know prestigious East Coast law school. So it has to be true. Mm. And yet they're, they're weirdly historically wrong about their historicism so <laughs> um something i wanted to just have you tease out because i thought it was such a, a a good theme that runs throughout the book which is i think the book makes a really good case uh and obviously i think you obviously would hope it does because it's what it is which is the case for religion in, in american diplomacy but one of the things i think it does really really well um And then I think is really compelling is you do that without instrumentalizing religion, which I think is a really hard challenge because I think a lot of people who do talk about religion and politics tend to instrumentalize it. It's, well, this is how we can get leverage or this is how we can persuade people. And it's just a tool because it happens to be, you know, uh, powerful in, and they know it's powerful in society. So, okay, it's, it's treated in a way like kind of a hacking device to to get at what you want from a group of people or from a country or, or from a polity. And, and I think the book does a really good job of stressing religion is really important to understand in foreign policy, but not at not in that way, not in that instrumentalized way. Yeah, and, and it it's always a danger in any transaction, but certainly in diplomacy for a large, powerful country to say, we're going to push every button we possibly can politically, economically to coerce you into doing things you don't want to do. Um, and, and so you, the power dynamic is always present and, and the power dynamic can always be manipulated toward in your favor versus a, a weaker country or a weaker group. Um, but I think this is where actually having some theological and historical training is helpful that I, there were times I did ask religious communities to do something specific. And a lot of times those groups said, no, nah, we can't do that. <laughs> and which, again, that's part of diplomacy. You have to have conversations to find out where the limits are, where the opportunities are, where the overlaps exist, where they don't exist. But you always have to have, you should have, and I, make, I think I make this pretty strongly, you have to be able to accept the answer no and not then resort to coercive means to say, okay, well, you can come back in 20 days after we do this or, or do that. Maybe I can change your mind. Uh, as a having somebody, I, myself, I'm still a member of a religious group. I don't want to be coerced by any government, be it the local school board or a, an international uh, interaction where somebody leans on me to do something that's against my own theological principles. And that's where we drew the line, that we would make our best case we would have a conversation, and at the end of the day, we had to respect. Now, sometimes I would ask, well, why did you say no? Help help me understand why, not so that I can come back at you a 21st time, but so that maybe next time I engage with another community, I'll be that much smarter. Uh, and I, I tell an example with the Vatican where we tried to get them to sponsor a, uh, an interreligious convening on refugee resettlement, uh, particularly um, in in response to ISIS and and the crisis that erupted then in Central and Western Europe in terms of the number of refugees. Uh, And I did go back and ask, can you tell me why? And they gave me great answers. And again, I I wasn't there. I was there to learn. I wasn't there to to lean on them. But that's a very hard temptation, I think, for a lot of diplomats and a lot of countries, frankly, uh, to resist because we, we do live in an authoritarian arena globally. And one of the hallmarks of many authoritarian governments 
is they have a favored religion and they have disfavored religion. And so the the disfavored religious groups are always going to be on the receiving end of coercion, ranging from threats of death to harassment and a thousand stops in between. But I also think to to resist the the notion of uh, instrumentalizing religious groups American diplomats need to be clear about means and ends. And so you kind of go back to the, the Kantian notion of you, you see religious groups, I think, as uh, ends in themselves. They're not simply groups to be manipulated uh, towards American foreign policy ends. Uh, so you've got to be transparent about why you're showing up and, and talking. Uh, and you've got to be able to say uh, to accept no when, when somebody is, doesn't want to participate with you or partner with you in any way. Um, well, I had, I had intended to bring up the, the, your really great discussions at the Vatican and the book. And I think this is probably a good time to do it, which is obviously if we're talking about religion and foreign policy, there's probably no more perfect distillation than a microstate. That's entire entity is the administrative institutions of the Catholic church. Right. Uh, so I'm really interested in, in, in more, um anecdotes but also just more of your thoughts about like how did a lot of these principles bear out in those interactions because i imagine that's a place where that is to a degree the entire kit and caboodle right like religion is is what the vatican is it is and it is also a state uh so when you're doing foreign policy with the vatican you're doing you're doing religion in in diplomacy the whole time right Um, so I'm curious about, I guess, how are those dynamics when you enter the office, and especially um, interacting with the Vatican for the first time using this new office? And then also, how um, do you think it helped? And then, and then similarly, I think just sort of what were the things you observed about the dynamics of those particular diplomatic uh, interactions? Well, first of all, I think it was a very fruitful four years. You, know, you think about uh, Pope Francis became Pope in 2013, and uh, and then uh, the Obama era ended in January of 2017. So there were about four years there of just amazing diplomacy, and it cut across climate change, refugees. It was particularly important in Cuba, and we might want to talk about that. I have a, ch- a p- portion of a chapter on, on what we did in Cuba. Yeah, I think know. absolutely. If you want to, if you want to go into uh, Cuba, particularly through this, that's okay. not great. Well, let me let me let me start at the beginning. I mean, the reality is John Kerry's a very serious Catholic, and uh, and one of the first trips I took with him was when he had a day open up in his schedule in early 2014, and he was able to secure an appointment with the newly appointed Vatican Secretary of State, and so I flew with Kerry there, and literally three or days, three or four days before that uh, trip. Pope Francis had made his first address in January of 14 to the diplomat, the Vatican diplomatic corps. So, you know, there are dozens of countries that have diplomatic relationships with the Vatican. And historically, the Pope every January talk gives them a lecture. And so I showed Kerry that Pope Francis's global priorities diplomatically and the Obama administration's overlapped like 80 percent. And I suspect that was the first time in American history when there was that deep of an overlap. Now, there were there were differences, obviously, abortion and other issues. Uh, But I told them, I said, they care about what you care about. And this is an opportunity for you to meet your your peer. And he was a veteran, uh, Cardinal uh, Pietro Perlin, a veteran of the Vatican diplomatic corps. And I, I wrote a memo saying, here are the issues I think you should talk about. And it was astonishing to walk into this room and see two diplomatic professionals just immediately see that there was a partner sitting across that table. And uh, Kerry, I think, still maintains a, a personal relationship with uh, Cardinal uh, Perlin, lo these many years after he was Secretary of State. So we got off on a, on a good foot. I, I think Perlin saw instantly that Kerry was eager to collaborate with him. And there was just, you know, it was on Israel-Palestine, it was on refugees, it was on Cuba. Um, So then you fast forward, we now know from uh, Ben Rhodes' book, The World As It Is, that uh, the Vatican helped navigate some early conversations between uh, the Cuban government and the American government, which led eventually to Obama 
I think it was in December of 2015, recognizing or restoring diplomatic relations with Cuba. He had the power to do that as president. He could not, however, lift the economic embargo, which has been in place for what's now 50 years or something. Um, and I got to be one of the first diplomats to go and visit uh, Havana. And in their liberality, the Cuban government gave me 36 hours on the ground. <laughs> Uh, and I, I met with dozens of, of groups and individuals uh, in, in uh, the Cuban uh, religious landscape, which was amazing. Met with the auxiliary bishop of, of the archdiocese there at that point. The, the cardinal was actually in Rome. I mean, the audacity. He didn't stay to talk to me. He went to go see the pope. Uh, but we we met then with, with a number of uh, Protestant Christian groups. We met with a Buddhist organization. We visited the synagogue in Havana. We visited the, the mosque that was in Havana. And everybody there just rejoiced that Obama had restored diplomatic relations. And they, they said it was long overdue. They also said that at that point, most, not all, were being given more room to operate by the government. Uh, in, in essence, they were freer to do what they typically did within their own community without interference. Uh, and they thought that that had markedly improved in the Obama era. So there was at least some anecdotal data to suggest that opening up uh, diplomatic relations was going to uh, perhaps usher in a, a new <clears throat> era of relationships. Uh, and then finally, all those groups wanted America to, to lift the embargo because they, they all had friends. They had uh, comrades in theology back in the United States. As one person told me everybody has a cousin or an uncle back in the United States. Uh, and now, unfortunately, the Trump administration reversed that. And we're, we're kind of back diplomatically where we were prior to December 2015. We'll, we'll see if that begins to unfreeze a bit. But religion played a huge role in that. The Vatican itself played a brokering role between the U.S. government and the Cuban government. And I think historically, American diplomats have looked at the Vatican and have really not known what to do with them. Uh, and yet Francis has, has completely reformed the Vatican diplomatic corps and really upped its professional game, I think, in the, his uh, in his uh papal years. It's now interesting to see what will happen next, because obviously at 85, he's not going to be there forever. Um, but I think the, the Vatican is looking for a reset. I, I tell a story how at the end of the Trump years, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo went and insulted the Pope in public at the Vatican <laughs> over their alleged uh, leniency towards China human rights violations, which was a, a complete canard. But the Trump administration made a, an explicit political decision that opposing Trump and trying to make him look bad, I mean, opposing uh, the Pope and making the Pope look bad was going to be a higher political payoff domestically than it was supporting Francis, which is just a cold eyed, Manichaean, Machiavellian uh, political move that has nothing to do. In fact, it's bad diplomacy. It's not even. This is OK. I do want to I want to jump off there because it's so that's so interesting to me. I have um, another set of questions that I do want to want to pose based off what you just said. But the, but you saying that right then was is so interesting to me. Because one of the one of the odd trends of the Trump era has been um, the prominence of a lot of very um, vocal, uh, if not like a large group, but very vocal Catholic political thinkers, right, who have adopted a kind of anti-liberal, um, if not directly, some of them directly pro-Trump, but some of them just sort of saying. Uh, you know, I'm not for Trump per se, but I'm also, but I am for tearing down the institutions that he's tearing down. Um, and and so I find that really interesting in terms of the dynamics of his particular kind of support among the Catholic community in the United States and then that antagonism with Catholicism as a world religion. Yeah, I, I think they, you know, Steve Bannon is, is, is right in the middle of that and he's trying, he's been a in opposition to Francis almost from, from the beginning. Uh, I don't think Trump has a strategic brain. I don't think Trump has a strategic brain that wants to understand religion at even anything approaching deeper than the surface level. He just came to the conclusion that beating up on Francis, and, and all he had to do was look at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. There's so many anti-Francis bishops there. It's an embarrassment to the Catholic Church. Uh, 
he just made the cold, quick view, cold eyed view that uh, if I attack Francis, I'm going to get more of those uh, Catholics to come vote for me uh, in, in the general election. Now, there were some more sophisticated people within uh, earshot of the uh, president who who have a little more uh, savvy and, and sophistication. But the, the common denominator there, if it's anti-Francis, it's going to be good for us. Yeah. Um, and that's basically what Pompeo came and did uh, by attacking their allegedly weak policy with China. By the way, the policy between the Vatican and, and, and China is a private agreement. Nobody knows the details of it. And nevertheless, the administration was able to say it's a bad deal, uh, even though we don't know the details, but we know it's a bad deal because Francis is the guy. So uh, it, it just was one of the more shameful episodes in public diplomacy uh, on the part of the, the Trump administration. And the, the Pope was the target of it in, in the Vatican. Yeah. Um so that does lead me back to the other the other kind of area I wanted to explore with you, which is your your story there about Cuba uh, and what you just said. I think also highlights something that's really central in your book, which is this capacity of a highly informed approach to religion and diplomacy. Right, the, the function of the office that you led uh, being this notion that you can collect and ascertain many facts, right? A lot and have a, a, have a highly diversified understanding of whatever object it is that you're you're working on. Um, and you deal with that. You you twist, uh, you take on uh, Isaiah Berlin's twist right on the hedgehog and the fox, particularly as an example of the debacle in Iraq as a function, right, of this kind of in a way the hedgehog knowing one big thing, right? What 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 Bush knew right, was these kind of big clash of civilization style understanding of what was unfolding, right? And this, and that it was a conflict between um, not even really Western style democracy, American style democracy, right? And, and um, a kind of Muslim world, but, but with a very thin understanding, right, of the actual internal dynamics within Muslim politics and, and the various groups that have different kinds of ideas and claims on uh, politics and liberty and, and and how processes should work. So I'm curious, I mean, you can get into the Iraq aspect of it, but I also just think more broadly, this this notion of how, how incorporating religion allows us to be people who think in uh, less monolithic terms about the places we are trying to, to approach. Yeah, as you know, in the book, I talk about sort of several alternate approaches to religion diplomatically all of which are, are insufficient. One is the sort of uh, the religious freedom that, yeah, we're for American style religious freedom everywhere. And we'll go around preaching sermons and occasionally showing up and, and demarching certain countries for bad things they do. But we have no real, no no attempt to leverage them in any way to, to make them change their behavior. But we, we throw a massive annual report at them every year, which they just sort of shrug at now. Uh, part of it is because a lot of American diplomats cannot imagine religion actually ever causing anybody to do anything significant because in the American scene or their personal lives, religion's no longer a thing. How could any rational person around the world ever do something dramatic politically because of their religious beliefs? Now that's just empirically not right. That that's a that's a poor analytical model. You know, when you step off a street corner in Kiev, Ukraine and say, we well, you know Religion's not in the air here. We don't. We don't, don't need to worry about this. Or you do it in Cuba, or, or you do it in Israel, Palestine, or you do it in Iraq. Then you're you're going to miss diplomatic signs and information, and you're going to make bad, bad mistakes. And so, one of my theses is that ignorance of religion, whether willful or accidental, can be costly. It can be deadly. And that's why I, I call the chapter that looks at the uh, Iraq story, the seven trillion dollar hedgehog, because that's the overall cost that Americans will have paid by 2030 for the forever wars. And I try to show it four or five stops along the way. Uh, ignorance of religious dynamics led to the uh, bad things cascading and, and growing. Uh, I think another way a lot of American diplomats approach religion is to analogize off of their own upbringing. So in, in case of my generation, people think about their angst ridden adolescent years about guilt and God's love. And well, if, if that may be so maybe that will help explain why a young Muslim man left London and went to uh, to to Iraq to fight with ISIL. 
and, and my argument is leave your angst ridden Protestant religious experience at home. Do not bring now. I now ironically, I, I do say that there are some things from those experiences that might help you, but for as in terms of a reductive one size fits all interpretive frame, that one's not going to be good for you. You need to find out to the extent you can. Now, with respect to ISIL, we couldn't call a truce and send an army of anthropologists over there to in, to interview ISIL fighters. They know really, really we want to know. Was yeah. it twelve when you were twelve years old? You had that bad experience with an imam that set you off, you know. Um, but in the absence of that, the astounding willingness of American intellectuals and bureaucrats, academics, and diplomats to assume that it's all about class, it's all about childhood trauma, and to come up with these easy answers um, just w- was not the way to go. So we argued instead, you know, there actually are people who studied religion in that part of the world. They know it's, why don't we talk to them? And I hired some of those people on my staff because I, I had no answer to any of those questions. But uh my thesis was that had America, had George Bush had the capacity and the inclination to ask those questions, he would have gotten better answers and perhaps we would have never invaded or we would have run the war quite differently. Mm-hmm. But that administration did not care. He had his one big idea. He was going to bring democracy to the Muslim world and Iraq would be the first domino to fall. And before you know it, we would impose a version of Western liberal democracy. And, you know, 12 months later, boom, the Middle East would be transformed. And the mind-numbing naivete of that is something that is literally, that trauma it generated is inscribed on the bodies of tens of thousands of young Americans today. Yeah. I think what I love about that criticism is that it gets at something that I'm, because I do want to kind of turn and have this conversation about where America's at today or even where it's been at the last five years, you know, when you, since you've not been in this office, but kind of playing a kind of exercise of how would you be thinking about these problems if were you still running it? Uh, and, you know, I, I, I like the way you deal with the, the issue of, of Bush and Iraq, because I think some Americans are just really inclined to criticize democratization as an impulse in general, which I find a little disturbing because I think that the the desire for America to stand for liberalizing democratizing forces is in principle a good one in what you do is pick at the implementation right that 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 there was this incredible disconnect between what they thought they were going to be able to achieve and how they went about it and what they thought was even important in order to achieve those things and i think that's such a critical you know no i don't think we should have been in iraq anyway obviously based on at least the reasons we were there with the the WMTs but there's no denying that, that there was a terrible regime in place right. and i i like that the critique follows in those those more of those those crevices of how the actual event unfolded cuz sometimes i worry when i hear americans say some of the things that have been said about why we shouldn't have been in iraq what i also hear is part of a broader conversation about Americans being just less interested in projecting values. And there is a world in which that's a really bad thing if we're not interested in in standing for democratic and liberal and humanitarian values. And obviously we haven't done that particularly well uh, times, but I think it's concerning if that's not something we're interested in projecting at all. Yeah, and it's sort of triply ironic that early on, uh, when Paul Bremer and the, the provisional uh, authority were were trying to produce an, a constitution, and ironically, they were going to not allow the Ira- the Iraqi people to write their own constitution. <laughs> so you don't know it yet, but you, you want to, you you really do want to be a liberal democracy, but we don't trust you to be able to to uh, handle that job. So we're gonna we're gonna write it for you and. The most powerful religious leader in Iraq, uh, Ayatollah Ali Sistani, said no. He issued a fatwa saying, if we're going to have a constitution, by golly, we ought to be able the ones who write it and, and ratify it. And Paul Brimmer said, the heck with that. Uh, 
So the, the Ayatollah proved to be the real Democrat, little d, in the room. Actually, they never met in, in the same city, uh, actually same country. Um, he proved to be more democratic. So we at least saw, ironically there, an impulse, an indigenous impulse on the part of many powerful people and rank and file people in Iraq to write a constitution. Now, at the same time, people like Senator Brownback, who eventually became the ambassador of for international religious freedom, uh, said, well, we, we, we have to make sure it's not a constitution for uh, a, a, an Islamic republic. We cannot, we have to have separation of church and mosque. <laughs> and again, we failed to be the Democrats here, but the Iraqi people were the ones saying, actually, if we choose to have uh, an Islamic republic, we don't want you telling us we can't do that. So, I mean, I, I agree. I, I don't believe that exporting liberal democracy through invasion um, is a very good model of democracy promotion, <laughs> or at least we've never been able to make that work very well. Um, so I, I, I'm under no illusions that it's easy for a country to transition from an authoritarian government to a liberal democratic constitutional system. Um, but man, we bungled it. <laughs> we bungled it in just about every possible way in Iraq. So that should chasten us. I, I don't think it should drive us away from commending liberal democracy to people and supporting it. But when we have power of the pen and we're going to say, you're really going to love this constitution, we're going to write for you. Uh, it, at that point, I think we, we have uh, we sabotaged democratization. Um. So, yeah, that does bring me to thinking about some of the current problems in letting you sort of play at if you were still being able to give this advice and you were still being tasked with these with thinking right. about problems for for the for the State Department. Um, yeah. one, one issue you touch on at the end of the book is LGBTQ rights. And right. I think you make a very fair case that, you know, it, there's only so much the United States can do there because. Uh, oftentimes when you do promotion of rights, what you get is reaction uh, at the uh, at the domestic level and you and you can cause harm, right? You can make people targets. But one of the things that's troubling to me now, if we think about international politics, is you know, when you were at the uh, at the at the State Department, those years, uh, you mentioned they were great years with with Pope Francis. There were also pretty great years across, particularly the the uh, Anglophone world, in terms of uh, liberal democracies for for gay rights. Right? Uh, right in that period, right, essentially the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, all took measures uh, to expand LGBTQ. Rights and one of the things that I find troubling now is you see in some ways a kind of similar in that world, in that especially in that Anglophone world, pushback. Uh, this kind of globalized pushback, particularly against trans people, but also frankly against LGBTQ people more generally. And I'm, I mean, I I know this is sort of a, a very specific road to go down, but it is something that that has. In, it captured me a little because it is. It seems this time around to be so transnational uh, and so integrated with the broader kind of pushbacks that are occurring that are not the same, but do have linkages, right? Between. Um, well, I, I think it's a. I think it's part of the global. Whether you call it growth of right wing populism, right. whether you call it fascism and authoritarianism and whatever that nexus of, of issues are, it's part of it. Look in our own country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's more dangerous for a trans person today, I think, than it was 10 years ago, because we have politicians publicly saying, you know, you can't say these words, you can't teach this curriculum, you can't let these people do this, this and that. Now, that was all uh, maybe it was more institutionalized and people felt like they didn't need to talk about it because they had it under control, quote unquote. But certainly, I think violence against LGBT folk in the United States is up, trans folk is particularly. So I see it as part of this rightward turn in terms of authoritarian governance. Again, picking scapegoats, picking enemies that they know if we keep kicking these people and holding them down, we're going to reinforce our own political base. So I think we're seeing it in the States. I think we are seeing it. I, I think the, what we tried to do was to argue for de decriminalization, which I, I think is, in fact, you know, I, I had this conversation with a, a Catholic senior leader in West Africa. And I think I, I think I tell the story in the book. 
where before our conversation really started, he said, Dr. Casey, I have one, one really pressing question for you. And he said, I understand in order to get a grant from USAID, this is the Agency for International Development, one has to be gay. <laughs> now, I heard a lot of crazy things, both yeah. in the State Department and outside. That was a new one on me. And I kind of looked over at my Africa advisor and she's looking at me like, <laughs> It's like, do you want to do you want to pipe in here? But but I said, I said, Your Excellency, if you only believe one thing coming out of our conversation, believe me when I say that is not true. Right. And he said, Well, I'm I'm really, I'm really glad to hear you say that. Uh but so he indicated, like, I'm not sure if I buy it. <laughs> but but anyway, what we then went on to have a conversation, and I I didn't despite the fact it was very tempting, argue theology with my interlocutors. That that was not my role. I mean, I am trained in theology, but but uh, the State Department was not out there promoting particular theological views. Wow. But I did pivot to, to, to decriminalization. I, I said, you know, uh, you believe in basic human dignity and that everybody has certain uh, inherent rights, including a right not to be beaten or to have their life taken uh, because of their their lifestyle, you may or may not disapprove of, and you, your own your own church teaches that that behavior should not be criminalized. Is that not right? And he acknowledged that's right. So decriminalization was a way where we could have conversations. Now, I had people inside the building. I had people adjacent to our building, as I tell in the book, who who then told the story that the, somehow the Office of Religion and Global Affairs was the tip of the spear of, of the global Obama uh, gay marriage promotion campaign. I, you know, when I hear that, I read that part of the book and I thought, I think a lot of gay people really would have loved if there had been a global gay agenda, <laughs> but there wasn't. <laughs> well, but, but they also were real, particularly, you know, gay advocates on the ground in the various problematic parts of the world were like, please do not do yeah. that. Because that, at least in the short run, that was only going to make their lives uh more miserable and we would have inflicted we would have helped inflict harm on them if, if that had, had been the case but I, th- I think you know the the speed with which the united states has made progress on the human rights of lgbtqia folk is on the one hand breathtaking mm-hmm. but the pushback now is equally breathtaking because we're at a moment where you could see it tipping dramatically in, in some very, very bad ways, not only here, but also around the world. I don't think there's a magic formula that says if you do these five things, somehow the world's going to see it the way uh, we do. But I think it's one where we have to be vigilant. We have to be patient. And we also have to be clear that people should not face uh, harm to their body or their literal existence if, in fact, they are members of, of these communities. I think it's going to be a long fight. I don't think it's going to be uh, something that gets solved overnight. But the other thing I'll say here is that as the diplomatic core itself becomes more diverse in terms of its sexual orientations, that's going to be a plus. It, I think the more other parts of the world see in America LGBTQIA folk being regular members of our government, regular open people who participate in our society, uh, that's where a lot of change is going to occur is when people actually encounter folk and talk and communicate and begin to see uh, that whatever alleged harms they they bring are in fact false. Um, so this is sort of a, a religion adjacent question, but it also ties into the sort of network of populism and, and right-wing pushback that we just started discussing which is and i think interesting because you've been critical of some of some of those some of the social science that's come out on this which is uh the spread of QAnon uh as an international thing right uh, and i think it's appropriate to talk about this in the context of religion because there are aspects of it that are simply very akin to religious belief whether or not it's appropriate to to fully put it in that bucket i mean i think that's something i'd love for you to tease out some of the distinctions but there are there are elements of it that that take on a kind of and also we know that some not all but some church networks have been conduits for it um i you know one of the really interesting and disturbing things where i don't know if uh 
you get a chance to to see this four corners in all in Australia, the ABC in depth, they're sort of like their 60 minute style show. Uh did a great piece a few years back. Uh Scott Morrison, who is a uh the the former prime minister, the one before the current, right? And um he was an evangelical kind of kind of distinct in that way in Australia for being a a um an evangelical Christian, but also uh, there were some stories that came out essentially about people in close proximity to him who had strong QAnon ties, people, close family friends, and whether or not, you know, the 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 investigative reporting there kind of got into things that may not feel relevant to an American audience, but we obviously have a global uh, interest at Pulaski, uh, whether or not, you know, those things that were were uh, a problem, right, having those kinds of beliefs and, and vo- things uh, voiced clearly within close proximity and a sort of intimate relationship to the, to the prime minister or problem. But what I found more fascinating was here's a great example of the global networks along which this stuff can spread. Um, it's not just within the sort of Anglosphere. Germany has also become a kind of hotbed for, for QAnon thought, but, but I do think it's an interesting current dynamic. Um, and we could, we could, leave it at QAnon or we could expand it out to to other kinds of, of systems of, of radicalized thought. But I, I thought QAnon's interesting because it plays a, in some ways it imitates religion without being religion. Uh, and I think there is some interesting uh, uh, threads there for all the things you've been talking about. Yeah, I mean, we, we could spend hours talking about this. Let me, let me say a, a couple things. Um, I mean, the first thing is my inclination is always follow the money. Uh, you know, to, to the extent that there are nefarious right wing dark money sources here raining down on these various organizations, uh, I think that needs to be investigated by both, you know, the U.S. government uh, uh, domestically, but also the international money flows. And there are, I mean, the the Russian government uh, and those adjacent to it are, are raining down lots of money. Uh, you know, you've seen the National Prayer Breakfast now separate out because members of the U.S. Senate realize that some of the money uh, that's behind this, they they can't fully justify or understand. Uh, I think we need to shine a bright light on, on the money flow because QAnon, QAnon is not just an, uh, a thing that has flowered because it's such a group of powerful ideas and communicators. I think people are getting rich off this somewhere. Uh, but also, I, I think on civil society, uh, I think Christian churches have done a really lousy job of of driving these crazies out of their own communities, you know, and, and I, I think that there's some anecdotal evidence to suggest that a lot of conservative evangelical pastors uh, are very vulnerable vocationally, and a lot of them can be fired after, you know, 20 minutes after a bad sermon. If the right three people speak up in church, you can be literally out on the street. So that doesn't create a... a, a an ethos of accountability and honesty in the so-called teaching office of the church is very weak today in some of these uh, some of these Christian communities because they have very weak polity that you don't protect the clergy well if they're trying to address these kinds of controversies uh, officially. I don't think we have enough social science to understand those congregational dynamics. You know, people do these polls that say, well, you know, 12% of QAnon beliefs can be found in any Christian church in America. And, and that kind of social science is not particularly helpful or revelatory. I think the churches themselves and the people who train them need to think long and hard about how do you drive this kind of right wing drivel, in fact, dangerous drivel out of uh, churches. And uh, and I, I just don't know how that's going to happen. But right now, uh, the sociologists are not going to answer that question for us, I guess. Um, so I, the comparison is, is QAnon a religion or not? I, I don't I don't have anything really interesting to say about that. I, and you you can start a fight in any religion department today in America by saying, well, no, really, what is religion and how do you define it? And I just I, I don't have a dog in that fight. Um, but it does seem to be church adjacent. There seem there seem to be lots of congregations where you'll get a, a cadre of maybe small cadre or medium cadre of people who actually explicitly do follow QAnon, which in my understanding, no way follows anything remotely orthodox in terms of Christian theology. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's well put. I, you know, it, it just, it, um, it's interesting to me that it, the way it seems to continue to be for, for a conspiracy theory, and you're correct with, with follow the money, but 
uh, for a conspiracy theory that originally was so tethered to Trump. It's so fascinating to me the way it continues to metastasize and grow and 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 and, and transform uh, well after he's no longer been in 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 office and well after so many of the sort of original kind of conceits of it don't really apply. Yeah. Uh, uh, to the extent. Uh, QAnon leads to armed insurrections and leads to physically trying to overthrow governments, then it should be an object, I think, of great public and even government inspection. Now, if it ends up just producing very weird, hybrid, bad Christian theology, I don't think the government has an interest or stake in, in, in watching that. But it's when it is actually moving people to do things like talking about or actually trying to overthrow the government, that's a different animal. In my view, um, so I, I guess uh, as a as a kind of this is the the last thing I ask as an academic question, and I have like you know our chatter that I do want uh, to ask you about, um, which is um, so much of this I think is 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 really fascinating in terms of coming into office, second primarily the second Obama administration. And in a lot of ways, still dealing with the repercussions of the foreign policy choices made by the Bush administration. But also, you know, we've discussed even uh, at home in America, some of the ways in which we've fallen short, both in the past and, and today uh, on different issues. And I'm very curious as a way to kind of tether some of this stuff together and, and a kind of uh, maybe maybe a grand idea sort of question for, for a diplomat, which is, how does the relationship between America's moral standing kind of writ large in the world play into our ability to do diplomacy around religion? Uh, because obviously our moral standing is not something that is just a given. We, we, we've learned a lot. We've learned the hard way over the last decade or so that we have to work for it, right? And that, and that there are moments and ways that it, we can genuinely lose that, that position. Uh, so I'm very interested in how that particular dynamic plays out in our capacity to engage in a diplomatic way uh, on issues of religion. I think it's it's even more complicated when you look at religion in, in that sense. The, the I think one of the most traumatic days I had was the day I was sworn in and I walk in to the building and I'm, I'm the one guy that's supposed to be the global expert on, on religion around the world. And, you know, there's seven plus billion people and probably 70 billion discrete forms of religiosity. And, and the notion that one one person can be the special representative to, to all of that, it was just ridiculous on the face of it. So I had to build an office that reflected American religious diversity. But I could not ask that question in interviews. I, I could not say, oh, at the end of the day, we're going to be 20 percent this, 20 percent that, 5 percent this and 12 percent that. Um, but we at the end, we did build a, a religiously diverse set of, of employees. So that meant when I traveled, I don't think I ever took a single trip with a white Christian advisor next to me. OK, so we modeled a kind of uh, of inclusivity religiously on our set. Now, we have folks who've never had a religious thought or commitment in their lives. And that, you know, that, that was fine. So but we then were radically inclusive. We met with almost everybody we met. There was one or two examples, which I tell in the book, where people asked me to do jump through certain hoops in order to get to a meeting with them. And I was not willing to do uh, but if we ever printed a list of, of everybody who came in, there, there would be some interesting conversations because we met uh, from far right to far left and, and just about every imaginable uh, religious uh, combination you could think of, because it does make a difference when you show up. And, and I I worried, particularly at the outset, because you Google me, I'm, I'm a white Christian guy, I'm a bald guy, I've got red face. I mean, I just, I, <laughs> you know, I didn't represent a diverse America. People would just would look at me and I knew we were dead in the water if, if everybody looked like me. Um, but people were actually quite happy to have somebody come in who had studied religion. I, you know, I had been clergy. I could honestly look people in the eye and say, I hear really great things about the work your community's doing. And they they were 
they really didn't care so much about well, what tribe are you from, rather than you, I could affirm the work of, of other communities in, in, based on my knowledge, not just blowing smoke. Uh, and that went a long way. And, and I had to listen. I had to listen to some painful recitations of bad American foreign policy. And most of the time I said, yeah, you're right. But I'm still here. I still have questions. Can we still talk? Um, and, and people were willing to do that. But I had to, to take the moment to listen and hear their, their complaints, hear their questions, to get to the point where we could have an actual conversation about whatever issues diplomatically were live at, at that moment. And then we would have good conversations. But you couldn't go around the bad American history. You had to go through it and listen to the critique. Um, so certainly our, our standing in the world's been hurt. And in those last few months of uh, 2016, the common thread in most of my international conversations were, was basically, has America lost its mind? Because at that point, you know, Trump was getting closer and closer and closer. And luckily, you know, I'm not supposed to comment on the elections when I'm an employee. I was able to say, well, not yet, <laughs> because it was an election. And then I didn't travel much at all after, after election day because it, it was kind of game set and match. <clears throat> so certainly... I think our standing in the world suffered dramatically. And, uh, you know, look at Iran. You know, Iran said, look, Trump walked away from the agreement we, we had. Why should we uh, come back to that table with Biden offering to go back into it when Trump may get reelected in two years? So in that sense, uh, we look like an unstable country zigging and zagging between Trumpism and not Trumpism. Uh, so to this day, despite the fact that we, we have a, a great, a great, remarkable team uh, in the State Department, there's always got to be this lurking question in the person across the table from those diplomats saying, wow, in 24 months, it may be a different thing. We may be back or we may be even in a worse position diplomatic. So how does that change our, our view of the long-term reliability of the United States? So it's sure it matters. Uh, and we, we have suffered. And until that gets addressed, uh, we'll continue uh, to be viewed with a jaundiced eye in many parts of the world. I think that's a, a very good summation of a lot of the challenges that you uh, that you set out to tackle in, in the job itself and then also lay out in the book. Um, so because we are interested, right, our, our, our chatter question on this podcast is always, because we're interested in the local places, kind of a tour guide question. And for you, I definitely think it, it, it's got to be, if someone is somehow, I don't know, maybe they got lost, uh, in Western Kentucky or Southeast Missouri, uh, uh, and you can make a recommendation. It can be it can be food. It can be a museum. It can be um, like a national park. Wh whatever it is, the state park that that are, that you would say they have to go see. Uh, oh my. What would you say? <laughs> well, let's see. You mentioned one. Uh, there's a great um, outdoor era area called Land Between the Lakes, which is yeah. between Barkley Lake and Kentucky Lake, which is where. The, the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers have been dammed. Uh, and and I, I grew up, I, I saw the, the uh, Barkley Dam being built as a child when I was eight and nine years old. Uh, it's just beautiful, beautiful uh, recreational outdoor area there between, uh, it's a big space, land between the lakes. The other, if, I think it's still there, uh, some of the best barbecue pork in the world is at Starnes Barbecue in Paducah, Kentucky. And please don't yeah. sue me if you make barbecue somewhere else. But uh, I, I've not spent a lot of time back there in recent years, but uh, that's always a, a great stopover. So there, there, there are two recommendations from somebody right. who hasn't been back in a while. You, you can do both of those within around an hour, hour and a half. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so and downtown, yeah. downtown Paducah has turned into a real jewel. I mean, that was yes. an economic, economic decline when I when I left town. That, the, re the renaissance there has been very, very impressive. My, my wife really wants to go uh, when we're in, whenever we visit my grandmother who lives in Murray uh, now. She used to live in a little, a town of 100 people called Fair Dealing. I know Fair Dealing. Yep. Yeah, Fair Dealing. Yeah. My grandfather was the preacher at the Fair Dealing uh, Church of Christ. Uh, but um, my wife really wants to go to Paducah sometime we're up there because they have a quilt museum. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. And she, she enjoys quilting. And, and if, if quilting is your thing, Paducah yeah. is your town. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Sean. Obviously, uh, we're very lucky and honored to have you as part of Pulaski, and it was really fun to chat with you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Alan. The Periphery is a production of the Pulaski Institution. I've been your host, Alan Elrod. 
Our music was written, recorded, and produced by Brandon Ragsdale and Cody Smith. Thank you for coming, and please join us next time.